Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. In November, PBS Books launched a formal partnership with the American Indian Library Association. Today's collaborative program represents our first children's program as we speak with Trailblazer and New York Times bestselling author, Cynthia Lytick Smith, sisters of the Never See and editor of Ancestors Approved, intertribal stories for kids. Following the conversation today, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience on Facebook and YouTube. Before we begin, you know, I always like to thank our library partners, 1800 strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations who bring this important content to their communities. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you today for being here and joining us. Now the moment you've been waiting for. It is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce Cynthia Lytick Smith. She is a 2021 NSK Newstat Laureate. And as you've heard, the New York Times bestselling author of numerous books for young readers, including Hearts Unbroken, which won the American Indian Library Association's Youth Literature Award. Her 2021 releases, both middle grade books, which we're here to discuss today, received 10 stars reviewed. Both books were named Best Books of the Year, and they were on multiple lists. She looks forward to the spring of 2023 when she will release Blue Stars, The Vice Principal Problem, number one in the Blue Star series. Cynthia is also the author and curator of Heart Drum, a native focused imprint of HarperCollins children's books. And she serves as uh, the Catherine Patterson inaugural endowed chair on faculty for the MFA program in writing for children and young adults at Vermont College of Fine Arts. Cynthia is a citizen of the Muscogee Nation and lives in Austin, Texas. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you, and hello. I'm delighted to be here. We're so honored to have you. Thank you. To moderate and guide today's conversation, it is my pleasure to have Senator Mary Kunish. She was elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives in 2016 and elected to their Senate in 2020. She is the first woman of native descent to be elected to the Minnesota Senate. Senate. As an educator, she retired from her role as a public school library specialist after 25 years of service. She recognized that students want to read and hear about kids that have common life experiences. Mary very intentionally and successfully built a library collection that reflects her native students and the rich diversity of the community. She is the daughter and granddaughter of members of the Standing Rock Lakota Sioux Nation. With a unique understanding, Senator is committed to supporting positive legislation for our American Indian and marginalized people in Minnesota. She, we are so honored to have her with us. She has done so much important work. She is such a trailblazer in this field, in this area. And it is my honor to, to welcome her. Just a side note, she is also, she has the role of assistant minority leader in the Minnesota Senate. And that is the first time a Native American has hold, held that position uh, in Minnesota. So we are so excited to have you, such a trailblazer. Before we begin and you get into the conversation with Cynthia, I was hoping you could share with me a little bit about your background, uh, your, your role and in your um, involvement in the American Indian Library Association. Sure. Well, how mataki yapte? I'm Petukinle Shantewashse, La Makota, and my name is Senator Mary Kunish. I am a state senator here in Minnesota, and um, just as you said, I was also a library media specialist for 25 years, and I can't think of a better job in a school than than to be able to do that. 
Uh, as a uh, educator, I often looked for ways to broaden my understanding around literature and authors. And, and just as it was mentioned, I know it is so important that our student uh, literature and hear stories about themselves or their ancestry as well. And so uh, always looking for uh, legend. Um, literature that really reflects our students. The American Indian Law, uh, Law, Library Association really made all the difference for me because they were able to uh, be an incredible resource. Um, ALA, as we call it, American Indian Library Association was founded in 1979. And we are there to increase awareness that there are library services for Native Americans, um, mostly because they have been so woefully inadequate. Uh, and so uh, what we try to do is address library related needs that really focus on American Indians and Alaska Natives. And so we develop programs to improve uh, Indian libraries, um, that carry our Native American authors. Uh, we want to be able to ensure that we have authentic stories about culture and language and information for our schools and the public and um, research libraries, especially on reservations. And so we're super committed to sharing and educating information about Indian cultures and language values and information um, with, with the broader uh, you know, communities, which is, this is so great. This is exactly what we want to do. We want to highlight this incredible author whose books have been my longtime favorite forever. Um, and it, we also have um, the responsibility of every year coming up with, you know, the current list of, of books for uh teachers and the public to read, um, but we also um, make an award, the American Indian Youth Award. And so I would encourage anybody and everybody to um, go to ala.net, A-I-L-A net.org and uh, read a little bit about us, learn about us. And there's so many great resources on our, on our, um, on our website. That's so wonderful. Thank you, Senator, for sharing all of that. And I know you guiding the conversation with Cynthia will be so wonderful. Cynthia also is such a trailblazer with everything she's she's done and created, and not only the books, but also her leadership in by curating um, the heart the heart drum. Um, imprint, right? So I, I'm so excited to to hear your conversation and I will get to talk to you both at the end of the show. Enjoy. Well, now is the great time that I get to have an incredible conversation, as I said, with one of my very favorite authors. And I have to tell you, I carried uh, probably all of your literature in my libraries, um, from your picture book, uh, the, uh, the Jingle Dress Dance, um, all the way up to many of these that, that we'll be talking about. But you really and truly are a trailblazer, just not for our um, American Indian communities and readers, but you are a New York Times bestselling author. And as it was mentioned, curator um, of content for Heart Drop, which is an imprint of Harper um, Collins. And so we're going to be looking at two of your uh, most recent books, one is called Sisters of the Never See. And I know that once folks start to, to um, hear more about this book, uh, there are gonna be a lot of kids that are gonna be clamoring for this book because it's a new twist on Peter Pan. So would you do us all a favor and just briefly share the premise and how you uh, sort of reimagine the story of Peter Pan from your viewpoint and the indigenous uh, uh, lens? Certainly. Mado and Stay Senator, it is such an honor to be here with you. And it, it is such a rare pleasure for me to be able to say Senator to a fellow Indigenous woman. Thank you for your leadership as in, in politics, in libraries. I'm so grateful for all you do and for raising up this conversation for young readers. So yes, Sisters of the Never See 
is a book that we call a middle grade novel. So the core audience for that is upper elementary school going into middle school. This gorgeous cover was created by Floyd Cooper. He was one of the greatest children's book illustrators who ever lived. He was a fellow tribally enrolled citizen of Muscogee Nation. And so this is a book that was both written and illustrated by Muscogee tribal members. It is a contemporary update to J.M. Barry's Peter Pan, a longtime classic of children's literature, which has many kid-friendly elements. It has flying kids and fairies and a storybook, not not real, but storybook pirates and mermaids or merfolk, if you will. And as a little girl, those elements all appealed to me. Also, at the same time, like a lot of kids, there were things that were just a disconnect. The depiction of Native people on the island. Why would there be Indigenous people on an island that was so magical? Why weren't, why weren't they at home in their tribal communities? I had so many questions. Um, also, the role of girls. You know, as a young contemporary girl, I saw myself in different roles than Wendy or Tiger Lily, more like you, more as someone who might someday grow up to be a leader in her community and make contributions in that way, as well as how villainy was handled. Um, lots, lots of, I don't know if you've read the original Peter Pan lately, uh, but this is a bit more gentle when it comes to sword fight. Uh, although there is plenty of swashbuckling adventure to be had. So I saw things about the very classic that, that I thought were really still kid friendly. I saw opportunities to re-envision it, to invite all children, including indigenous children into the magic to emphasize to them that they belonged in the world of books too, even in the world of fairy tales. Uh, you know, when we think about children's literature, what we're really thinking about is a long tradition stretching all the way back to, you know, the early storytelling circles. And certainly we want kids today to feel as though they can be the heroes of their own stories. And that's reinforced by seeing heroes like them in the pages of books. That, that's just so fabulous. You know, um, in the, the um, Native American tradition, especially up here in Minnesota, where it gets really, really cold in the winter, this is storytelling season. This is when, um, you know, our ancestors would hunker down inside their lodges and they would tell stories. And this is how they passed on the culture and, and, and taught uh, their, their children, um, you know, skills and moral lessons and that sort of thing. And I sort of felt like when I was reading that, that you had some sort of messages in there and you sort of alluded to it with the, um, the sword play in there. But why do you, um, I guess my question is, why now is it so important that we have these kind of stories um, uh, that we can share across the cultures, across the um, age levels, because I think there's a lot of adults that are going to enjoy this book as well. But is there any reason that, you know, or, or was there something behind why you put this book out or what inspired you to, um, to share your story at this time in, in, in our world? I do believe that we've reached a point in which cultural literacy is going to be as important as verbal or visual, especially because this is an ever more global society on every front, be it in literature, but also certainly uh, politics, in um, commerce. Our children are going to need to know how to navigate the spaces that may sometimes feel awkward or like more of a stretch between them. And one safe way in which they have an opportunity to first, um, you know, forge these relationships is in the pages of books by presenting characters who are fully rounded, three dimensional, authentic, with a range of emotion and experiences and perspectives. They, the young reader, has a chance to vicariously insert themselves in the story and navigate those conversations to um, become more aware of folks who may be different from them in some way that is affirming and also builds their confidence. Gosh, that is so great. We need those sort of stories and examples 
in this day and age, but the diversity of our communities is, is so wonderful. So um, in this book, uh, in your book, you have a character, Lily and, and Wendy, and they have a lot of things in common, but they have a lot of things that are very different. They, they both come from almost two different worlds mm -hmm. and they move to two different world, you know, into different worlds as well. I know that um, you grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City and in the tribal um, towns of Oklahoma. So you kind of got to straddle two different worlds as well. And so I'm wondering if that has any influence in, in your writing and in your work. Like a lot of Native kids, I was based in, um, well, in my case, a suburban area. A lot of them are in urban areas, but Native kids are everywhere. Small towns, tribal communities. A lot of times teachers will say to me, I'm, I'm not sure if we have any Native children in our classroom. And I say, you don't know. You can't always tell by looking. And it is safe to assume that you would want to create an environment in which if there is a Native child there, they feel welcome and loved and at home. Um, that said, I do think that the relationship between Lily and Wendy is really interesting. They're stepsisters and they're best friends and they love each other so much. At the same time, their temperaments are both wonderful and likable, but certainly sometimes in opposition in the way that all siblings are, be they in a biological or a blended sibling relationship. And so Lily is very pragmatic. She wants to be a scientist and she reads nonfiction and, and she studies animals and she's very fact oriented. So magic for her is something of a stretch. It takes her out of her comfort zone. It makes her ask questions she's never asked before. It makes her reevaluate the way that she sees the world. Meanwhile, Wendy is more fanciful. She is a fantasy novel reader. She is one of those kids who would have grabbed Sisters of the Never Sea right off the shelf and shared it with her siblings and gobbled it up. She loves the idea of fairies and she wants to be a wizard when she grows up. So, you know, you have these two very different kids and they have to learn to navigate that too in the family. It's, it's like a little microcosm. Um, you know, one of the things that we think about when we're talking about kids is that they, each of them is a world unto themselves. And there is so much tremendous diversity within every young reader that must be honored and respected. And so we try to do the same thing with their heroes in books. <sighs> I love that. That is really sort of uh, my mantra as a school librarian. But I'll also tell you, I grew up in a family of 13 kids. Oh, my goodness. So we all had different reading. You know, we loved to read and my parents totally encouraged it. Um, and so we all had sort of different flavors of 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 books, just like nonfiction, fiction, uh, fantasy, those sort of things. And so as I was reading that book, I could actually sort of see in my mind's eye when I was growing up and how we would sort of hand off certain things to the other, knowing that they would like that. I, I think that um, the relationship that those two young girls have is just so absolutely beautiful. You know, um, so many of our, our families today are blended families. And I think uh, there's a statistic that says about 40% of our families in the U.S., um, you know, have blended their, their, their families from, from different places and under different circumstances. And so it's really important to recognize, I think, as, as for kids, as they're reading this, that it's okay to be different, but still support each other and love each other and appreciate each other's little, you know, uh, personality in, in uh, syncrasies. And so um, I'm wondering, as you uh, wrote this book, do you, um, was there something or someone or maybe a couple of folks that influenced these, these characters that you have created in your book? Or is this just, were they just something that a little fairy landed on your shoulders and whispered in your ear, and now we have Lily and Wendy. Oh, well, first I would like my fairy, please. That sounds wonderful. And I need help with all of my future books too, if she is taking notes. Uh, that said, I am—I was raised an only child uh, with 
you know, my parents could have one. They said, at least we got a good one. And that was that. Uh, but I had so many cousins. And so it was like having siblings. You know, my aunties were like second moms. My grandparents' house was as much, if not more home in some ways, than mom and dad's. And it was very much that feeling of togetherness. One of my best friends is my third cousin. And a lot of people I meet don't even know their second cousins. It's just mysterious to me. So I wanted to show those kind of loving dynamics between peer kids. I also wanted to show that it's okay if you don't always agree with everything all the time. It's okay if you're different people. You can work it out through love and through patience and holding on. Sometimes it just takes time and uh, particularly in the case of the story, a little bit better communication. There are some assumptions on both sides as often happens in real life. And so the adventure of going to Neverland in part sort of forces both girls to stop and say, hey, this person is so important to me. This may be a sister that I gained through marriage, but this is the sister of my heart and I choose her forever. Mm. My son has a brother like that, not a blood brother, but uh, a, a, another boy that he grew up with. And they are, you know, they did the whole blood thing, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. And so yes, I can just, kids, yeah. yeah, I can just imagine this. So um, I always love it when I'm listening to authors talk about their work and their books. Um, I always wonder what their favorite part is. And, and so my next question for you is, do you have a favorite part of that book? And um, would you would you read that for us in your voice? Oh, certainly. You know, there there is a lot that I love about the fantastical and so much of it appears here. You know, we have the giant tick talking crocodile and uh, a somewhat boastful flying boy who reevaluates his life. But I'm a writer who draws very much on the natural world, uh, especially the celestial when I'm thinking about, um, you know, being watched over by the heavens, by the a sense of passage of time, a sense of connection to eternity. And so I will read a, a passage that touches on the perspective of the stars. So you get just a hint of what the voice of the narrator is like. The stars turn their attention to the younger children of the family, the ones who hadn't grown up yet. The stars knew what was coming, who was lurking. They always did. They'd seen it all before countless times across vast green oceans and ethereal night skies. They recognize the tiny, sparkling glow, nearly hidden in the wise old oak tree sprawling above the backyard. They recognize the crouched, shadowy figures within its branches. The stars weren't the only spectators closely observing Lily, Wendy, and Michael. Mm. I can just, you know, the imagery is just is just right there. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have any other traditional fairy tales that are maybe lurking behind us that you might be thinking <laughs> that to to uh, retell in a in a very unique way? I I have considered that due to enthusiasm for Sisters of the Never Sea and a desire to see indigenous characters in the uh, tradition of fairy tale that it might be worth revisiting, but I haven't landed on one just yet. I do have a little inkling in the back of my mind, but there hasn't quite been a commitment. No, oh, it takes a while for all of those to sort of percolate, right? For those characters to emerge themselves and, and uh, let you know that they're waiting to be told. I think that if we can use some of those 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 familiar stories, you know, that we have heard from, you know, European Americans and adapt them much like the Cinderella series that mm -hmm. that we have picture books of retelling that story in many different cultures. It's a, it, I have a whole shelf on my in my library that um, that tells those stories uh, in their own unique way. And so we will absolutely be looking forward to to those next uh, fairy tales coming out of your own work and and the experiences that you may have had. 
it gives us a chance to add our voice to the conversation. And and I know what you mean about Cinderella. I, I believe that the earliest Cinderella stories stretch back to ancient China. And mm -hmm. so there are some themes that bubble up again and again. Uh, and I think one of them is this idea of kids escaping to a world without parental figures in it and trying to figure out for themselves who they are and how they relate to one another. And so even though Peter Pan is um, springs specifically from Barry's vision originally, it does pull on some of the larger uh, traditions and storytelling elements of storytelling that we have seen from cultures around the world, including some that do parallel with some indigenous storytelling traditions. Yeah, I th we see it everywhere. We oftentimes just are not recognizing what it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm Senator Mary Kunish, and you are watching PBS Books. I'm here with trailblazing author Cynthia Lytek-Smith, uh, and we are discussing her two 2021 releases, Sister of the Never See and Ancestors Approved. And just a reminder, if you have a question for Cynthia, please don't forget to put it in the chat and hopefully we'll have time at the end to, to uh, answer those questions. So I think I would like to, I mean, I could, I, I, I could discuss this book for a long time. I have uh, <laughs> more questions, but I think it's really, really time that we move on to um, Ancestors Approved. This is really an incredible collection of intertribal stories um, about kids, for kids and uh, within it. So there are some stories that, you know, nearly brought me to tears and others that, you know, gave me a great big smile. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about that book as well. But before we go into that, uh, to the questions about that or uh, talking about it, would you please just give us a little bit of um, background about your your um, life and your ancestors? Uh, certainly. I am a um, tribally enrolled citizen of Muscogee Nation. Our people are originally from what's currently called uh, the southeastern section of the United States. We were relocated to Indian Territory, which is now um, currently called the state of Oklahoma, although we have regained some control of our tribal lands thanks to recent Supreme Court decision. Uh, my family is originally largely from Chicota, although now we have spread across through Oklahoma tribal towns. And you'll also find a handful like me who are scattered. I'm based here in Austin, Texas. And I have cousins, uh, you know, far flung. Um, I am blessed that some of my cousins do live here in Austin and that I am able to go home to um, visit family in Muscogee Nation. My grandfather was stationed at Richard Skabauer Air Force Base outside of Kansas City. He was a Muscogee man and he grew up at Seneca Indian School, which was in Wyandotte, Oklahoma. And when he was relocated to the Air Force Base, my branch of the family came up. Fortunately, it wasn't a relocation to Guam. You can drive home from mm -hmm. Kansas City to um, all those little towns, you know, to Okmogi to Muskogee in, in over the course of a weekend. So we were able to go back for summers, for holidays, for significant family events. And I have maintained um, that road trip up and down, you know, I, a lot of it is I-35 with some offshoots, uh, but ever since. And I am profoundly blessed. Mm. Sounds wonderful. Family, no matter how extended, is so, so very important. And we see that in, in, in this um, collection of stories and poems. And so uh, my next question is kind of like, what inspired you to compile, you know, gather all these middle school short stories and poems specifically by Native authors, um, you know, what was your process and how did you go about choosing which and, and what and how and why? Certainly. Uh, first, as before, I should mention that this cover art is done by an Indigenous illustrator. Nicole Needhart is Navajo, and I think she just did an absolutely gorgeous job with the shawl dancer. 
that said, uh, the powwow in the story is the Dance for Mother Earth powwow in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I went to law school at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And so I had a relationship to that place, to that event that went back a long way. Michigan also had the benefit of being in the central-ish, going east-west of the United States so that I could integrate stories from First Nations authors whose tribal homes were north of the U.S.-Canadian border. It was important to me to have the stories show in an organic way that that border is not necessarily a border between um, the indigenous lands as we think of them, per se. In fact, there are tribes whose ancestral territories and current lands do sort of border the two. So yeah. that was kind of the geographic reason. And then beyond that, a powwow is an occasion for kids of various tribes to come together. It's a family event. It's celebratory. There are a lot of different roles that children take on. Um, they might be dancers. Their families might be traders. They might be selling, you know, ever popular fry bread. There's plenty for them to do there. Wow. Well, there's plenty to do and read in in um, your book. And just as I asked you about your favorite uh, part or to read a part in Sisters of the Never See, um, do you have a favorite story or a favorite bit from this book that you'd like to share with us as well? You know, there are so many stories and both poems, the collection both begins and ends with a poem, the first by Kim Rogers, who's Wichita, and the last by um, Carol. I am blanking on Carol's name, even though she's one of my best friends. So, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think that if I picked any of them, that that would just be absolutely wrong. I will not do it. Carol Lindstrom. Um, but I would like to read just a bit from my note to the reader so that they have a sense of what the book is about and what the feeling of it is. Wonderful. Images of graceful dancers and powwow regalia, a blur of color, light, and motion, often are widely shared to reflect Native people today. Those vibrant photos and videos evoke culture, tradition, and community, celebrating a moment in time. Yet the Native dancers depicted and the intertribal powwows that surround them live well beyond that moment. They are multifaceted people and gatherings, each representing thousands of stories. A powwow is a terrific opportunity to highlight the diversity of the intertribal, native and first nations community of individual indigenous nations living within it and of young native heroes. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I'm looking at that, um, that poem, it's called, um, What is a Powwow? And there's, um, there's a lot in here. There's like so much about powwows. And if folks haven't had the opportunity to attend a powwow, you know, most of them are, are open to the public and they welcome non-Native folks. I mean, there's certain protocols. So do your own um, investigation about, you know, how to be respectful and appropriate at a powwow. But there's one um, part in here where it says, a powwow is a place for belly laughing late into a sleepy night with your grandpa Lou and then getting home after midnight. And I, I you know, we have um, powwows throughout the summer here in Minnesota and around uh, the Dakotas and into Wisconsin. And um, it makes me think of, you know, like if I'm sitting in the stands or sitting in a, a seat and watching the powwow, especially when it's late at night and the kids start to get sleepy and kind of quirky and, and um, adults are kind of are getting more, you know, tired, but they're excited because of seeing all the folks that they're there. And then when you hear the elders and the grandparents start to talk to their kids and, and um, that belly laugh, I, I mean, in my ears, it rings. I've heard it so many times. And so as I read that poem, um, it was, it, it really came to, to mind for me. And I think it's absolutely wonderful that we can see that imagery of what a powwow is like um, through those stories. I'm wondering um, uh, if there uh, are any writers or, you know, after you have made this collection, because I'm sure it was hard to pick these and then limit it to these, uh, do you think there will be another one or are there stories and poems that you either missed or that have come along since this was published that you'd like to um, maybe create another collection? 
Oh, certainly it has been uh, thought, suggested multiple occasions. Really, when you look at the list of these contributors, this is a snapshot in time. Yep. We, I put this together some years ago because it, it takes a while to create a book, especially one like this that is interconnected. The authors worked together to do the world building. In fact, this picture on the cover depicts one of the characters in one of the stories. So there was a lot of coordination involved. Since then, the Native children's and young adult writing and illustrating community has just expanded so magnificently. I couldn't possibly be more thrilled. Uh, we have reached a place in which I can say, hey, this is, um, you know, this is really a substantial group of people. If we were going to do a project, I would have to think so hard or I would just have to publish a much bigger book. It would just yeah. have to be longer. Yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah. You just have volume one, volume two, volume, two. volume three and keep going. <laughs> you know, I, I think back to when I um, started teaching and became a library media specialist and there were very, if, I mean, current literature that was um, truthful and, and, you know, first person authentic was non-existing. And we've come so far in the last, uh, I want to say like 10 years where Native authors are starting to, to really um, put out some incredible pieces of literature that, that really tell our story, the heartbreaking, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I just think that um, we can't be, um, you know, we can't show the gratitude. So many teachers would come to me and say, oh, it's Native American month. We need some books that we can read. Do you have anything to suggest? And for a long time, there really wasn't much at all. And then all of a sudden, there was this explosion of authors and incredible literature. And I just remember, you know, like saving a big chunk of my budget of books so that I could go to, we have a bookstore here in, in Minneapolis, the Birch Bark Book store. Um, Louise Erdrich owns it. She's a, a um, Anishinaabe author. And um, I would save a big chunk of money and go in there. And it was just like Christmas Day, picking books off the shelf and ordering them. So please continue. I, my message to us, all these authors is please continue to, to um, share your thoughts and your stories. It's The world is so much richer than that. So I guess our, my last question is, is there anything else coming down the pipe that you have for us that we can be looking forward to? Certainly. Um, first, I must say, you know, that, as you say, extreme growth is so much because of organizations like the American Indian Library Association, like organizations um, like PBS Books for lifting up our voices. I would love to take this opportunity to just briefly highlight some of the books on our heart drum list. Paperback copies are coming soon, so I will shine a light. This is Jojo McCoons. This is the first in a series starring a contemporary young girl. It, they're humorous. They're adorable. She loves her little cat, Mimi, and she has a very unique viewpoint on the world. <laughs> the Sea in Winter by Christine Day is a beautiful a emotionally rendered thoughtful look about the power of family love and persistence through adversity. It's so good for pandemic times. Healer of the Water Monster by Byron Young. This is a book that is very much rooted in the culture and the community of the Navajo Reservation and its belief systems in a way that is profoundly respectful and authentic. I'm so honored to have a connection to all of those through the imprint. And we have coming up The Summer of Bitter and Sweet by a debut author, Jen Ferguson. This is a book for upper teenagers. And it's about a girl who works at an ice cream shop and is wrestling with her past family complications. It has a bit of a mystery into the root of it, but also some kind of refreshing romance for those of you who like that sort of page turning element. As for me, I'm looking forward to the release of my graphic novel series, Sister, uh, sorry, wrong book. I already talked about that one. Uh, the Blue Stars, which is co-authored by Kekla Magoon and illustrated by Molly Murakami. Oh, 
I cannot wait to get my hands on some of those books. I, I look at the covers and, you know, covers do sell books and they do attract <laughs> kids. And every single one of those, I know that if I held them up in my library, um, kids would go nuts about them. So uh, kudos to the to the illustrators and the artists that that go along with the books and make them even more exciting to read. Anything, uh, any last words that you want to tell us uh, about being an author and uh, an Indigenous author as that? Being an author has been the greatest blessing of my life. If I could go back in time to when I was 10 years old and tell that very shy, sometimes bully little girl who would hide out over lunch hour in the school library because the librarian was so nice that she let her, I would say, hey, this world of books, this is where you can shine. And it, you can do it as your own self, but you can also do it vicariously through these stories and adventures. It'll open up a whole world of possibilities to you and it'll teach you how to be a hero too. That's what books do. That's what they're there for. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to meet you and talk with you. Wopalatanka, Chimigwich, Piamia. This has been just an incredible, credible opportunity. Madodo, thank you, my friend. Well, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, and I really, I just wanna thank Cynthia for your creativity, your works, your thoughtfulness um, for being such an advocate. Uh, both of you are advocates and both of you are trailblazers. Um, Senator Kunish, thank you for guiding the conversation and thank you for the work you're doing in Minnesota um, and, and for really our country, right? Because what we see is things start places and then they go other places throughout. I also want everyone to know that we will be speaking in May to the author, Dawn Quigley, um, when her second book comes out. So stay tuned. Uh, it is a PBS Books program in collaboration, again, with the American Indian Library Association. So um, thank you so much. Um, it's just been wonderful to have two trailblazers on this show. And until next time, um, from PBS Books, we hope you enjoyed this show and happy reading. <laughs>